So anyway, yeah, it's that, it's that, for me, it's that point in the circle. It's the 365 degree circle, right? Not the 360 degree. It's that chronological circle that we travel every year, and we come back to this point, and it looks a lot the same because we're, you know, we've all eaten likely more than we should have, and we are thinking about resolutions or going south or whatever. And uh, and, and it's, a good, it's a good, I like that that period of time because I, I like to just look back a little bit and say, you know, what would I change if I could? And I try to, to be realistic about that because I know that they're, you know, I could get excited and say, well, I'm going to do this and do that and yada, yada, yada. And, you know, most of that would never come true, but there are little things that you can change that make a big difference in that 365 degree circuit that all of us are going to run this year if, if God allows us the time to do that. So my dad uh, used to take me hunting. Um, and uh, it's, I don't know how old I was, I, but it, but it uh, seemed to me like he would take me out on the coldest days of the year. Seemed to me. And uh, I appreciate the fact that he wanted me to go with him. I was like, I was the bird dog that he never had. So he'd take me, he'd take me out and, and, and he'd, he'd call me Cal. So he'd, we'd go up to a brush pile and he'd say, jump up on that brush pile, Cal. <laughs> well, I'd jump up on the brush pile and, and then he'd say, jump up and down. I'd jump up and down the rabbits would go just like this. And, and he'd get a couple of them and then he'd just wait. He'd say, don't worry, they'll be back again by and by. You know, they came back as rabbits run in circles too. Just like you, you know, well, they do, right? Uh, it'd be better for them if they didn't, you know, at least when dad was around. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, and then, then he would take me out sometimes deer hunting. I never have, I never have killed a deer in my life. And I, a little, my manhood's suffering a little bit <laughs> from that. I've, I've shot at a lot of deer, if that helps, you know. <laughs> but, but the deer that I hunt, they, they jump up and down, right? And I pull the gun up, and they're jumping up and down in the scope, and I can't get them to stop, so I have to just take my best guess. And one time I shaved one really close. I thought I got it, but it was just a bunch of hair. And uh, anyway, so he'd take me up, and, and then uh, he would not only do the brush pile thing, but sometimes he would take me up and sit me in a tree, and he would say, now, Cal, stay here. I'm going to go out and make a circle, right? So he would go out and make a circle. I didn't have a clue where I was at the, at the time, and I was little, right? And littler than I am now. And, uh, and um, you know, and then I think, is he going to come back? Because I'd be up there, and the wind would be blowing, the tree would be swaying, and I'd be freezing, and, and my secret hope was that we could go home as soon as he got back, right? But it, just, it never happened that way. And we, we're always, we were out there till dark all the time. And the thing that amazed me about my dad is he, he could all, he didn't seem to want to use the well-beaten path. He didn't want to use the trails. And so after dark, he would just head in a direction. And all the time, he came out of the woods exactly where he planned to come out. Or at least it seemed that way to me. And I couldn't see anything. <laughs> I really couldn't see anything. He would, what he would say to me is he would say, Carl, take those two fingers and put them in my back pocket right there. And then hang on. Right. And, and that was what, and he'd lead me out of the woods and I was hanging on his back pocket. And, uh, but I, I've never uh, been lost in the woods, never worried. But with my dad, I did have a friend who, uh, I do have a wonderful friend who's a preacher's son who has been lost in the woods but never could admit it. So the, those little sheets are there um, for you to take notes on or write things down in case we make it, in case I finish in time to, for us to have a little discussion time afterwards and it and by the way if I say something that, and you think oh I gotta gotta talk to Carl about that just interrupt me please I, I love that and 
Um, but anyway, he would say, I'm terrible confused, right? He would say, I never was lost. Been turned around the woods. He called it terrible confused. He was from Lunenburg or some place like that. And, uh, and, um, <clears throat> but there have been times in my life when I've been terrible confused, really. And um, not so much in the woods, but in, in life in general, right? I, uh, you know, the times in life where you just don't know which way to go, sort of. And uh, you almost feel like, you know, I'm just as far ahead if I pulled out a coin and flipped it and decided, because I, I didn't really have any direction that was solid. And I've never really found it easy, never really found it easy to hear what God is saying in terms of those kinds of decisions. Should I do this? Should I do that? Whatever. Um, and New Year's, the New Year's season for me is one of those times when I long for that. I want to know, I want some direction in my life. I want to have a general idea uh, of which way to go. And I have this belief, Carolyn mentioned it earlier, that, um, that there are things that I can change in my life this year not, I'm not thinking so much of matters of right and wrong as I am thinking about things that would help me to experience God to a greater degree. Um, maybe things that I would just get healthier, right? Um, I want to keep my mind sharp, as, as sharp as I can. Um, I think, for me, the way that has always worked best is to read uh, and ponder and make myself think about things that I normally might not think about. But I, w I want to do some of those kind of things. And uh, things that would make a positive difference. So this morning in that circle where we are, the cusp of the new year, I'd like to, to, to sort of encourage you to think today about... Not so much, don't, don't call them resolutions, but just maybe listen uh, to God this morning and say, Lord, you know, what would you have for me uh, in the coming year? What are some differences or some things that I might be inspired to change or do differently or whatever that I believe would make a, a good positive difference the next time we come around here, right? So that so that at least next year we can say, well, that's, that's different, and I, I enjoyed that, right? As opposed to going, you know, I'm doing the same things all over again. Um, and especially if you're not happy about it. So I want to read some scripture to you this morning and uh, think about, uh, this, this is as close as I can come to, uh, scripture that might make us think in those directions, because I don't think the Bible is a book that, you know, gives you 10 steps to make your life better in, in, you know, 2016. I don't think the Bible works like that. I think it's a book that is about life, uh, life, you know, in a different time and place than you and I understand, different culture, and, and yet there are principles there that are transferable. So that's really what I'm looking for. Here is from, um, from Isaiah, and I don't have the reference, but I think you do. I think it's 43. Um, this is what the Lord says. What a, great, what a great way to start out. This is what the Lord says. I wish that I could get up in front of you and, and tell you this is what the Lord says about 2016. I wish, but I can't. As a matter of fact, I, I would struggle, if that's what I had to do definitively every week, I would struggle with that a lot because I can't speak definitively for God. That might be one of the, a good resolution for some of you. It would be to just say, I realize that I cannot speak definitively for God. So when I relate to people this year, I'm not going to represent myself as a spokesperson for God. I'm going to represent myself as a fellow traveler 
on a journey that we share together, and I'll share my perspectives, my opinions, my experiences, how God has related me, and I want to hear all about yours, but I'm, I'm not going to speak, try to speak definitively for God into your life. I struggle with that in my own. But that's what the way Isaiah starts. This is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I will send to Babylon and bring down as fugitives all the Babylonians in the ships in which they took pride. I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's Creator, your King. This is what the Lord says. Isaiah was a prophet. I guess he did that better than I think I could do it anyway. He, may, he who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out of out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. I can guarantee you that whatever it is that God does in 2016, it will be a new thing. I can guarantee you that, you know, whether we can identify it or not, that what God would like to do in all of our lives this year will be a new thing. Yeah. Now that, would, that, that means something that you've never experienced before will mean knowing God in a different way than you've understood him in the past. Now it springs up, Isaiah says, do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the desert, and streams in the wasteland, to give drink to my people, my chosen. The people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. So, in that scripture this morning, the first thing that uh, Isaiah established is, is who, who is speaking, right? Who is speaking? So Isaiah says, listen, this is who's speaking. And in, in, in my context, I like that because I, I want God to speak into our lives. And one of the things I struggle with at this point in my life is people deferring to, to pastors, people like me. Because I have this belief that you can understand and experience God as, as well as I can. I don't think you have to go to Bible college to be able to find things in the scripture that can encourage you and help you to live in ways that would bring more meaning and fulfillment to your life. I don't think you need to be a preacher, but I do think you need to hear God. Yeah. And, you know, one of the reasons why, this is just a personal preference, and we all have them, right? I don't, that's why I don't want your next to get sore. I was talking to Susan earlier, and she doesn't, she, her neck, can get sore. I guess all of us, that's why. So make those chairs comfortable and turn them around. But um, but I want God to speak to you. And I think that that's why I like the paper here, because I think sometimes God will speak to you and, 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 and you, we need to write it down, right? Right then, because you forget it if you don't. And sometimes it's just a word that God will. Sometimes it will just be a word that God has for you. And, and sometimes it it, it's not significant in the, right now, but it may have some significance for you later on. Because I do believe that God wants to speak to his people. Did you ever have God give you a word? I want to have this story. I was, I was going to uh, share it last week and didn't. But maybe this is a good example of, of uh, maybe this is a good time to, to tell the story. Right? I, have, I, uh, I had a friend who was on staff in church, church in Moncton years ago that I worked with. And there were 
more pastors there than you could shake a stick at. And uh, there was lots of people wanted to shake sticks at, a lot of them, and, and uh, myself included, I'm sure. But anyway, uh, this guy was a piano player. He was an uh, incredibly talented piano player. And he was one of those people who seemed to always get overlooked when a bunch of the other pastors were going up to lunch together. He missed the memo, so to speak, right? And uh, you could tell that it bothered him. I don't know if you've ever been in one of those kind of situations where you've, you've felt like it's been hard for you to break into a group of people or whatever, and, and it just seems to happen consistently. And after a while, that kind of thing carries a message that we tend to internalize, which just it goes something like this. I guess they don't want me, right? So I said to myself, I said, you know what? I'm going to make it a, a, a practice every week. I'm gonna, his name was Keith. I'm going to get together with Keith every week. And so we'd go out for coffee. And uh, um, But every once in a while, uh, I couldn't make the coffee appointment. And I'd have to say, Keith, I can't make it. Well, it was like breaking up with your girlfriend. I've never done that. I always got dumped. But <laughs> so I really don't know much about that. And, but um, anyway, so, you know, he was hurting. He was hurting. He was, hurting. Uh, he was eff effeminate, but he was like, he was like a linesman on a, he was a big, big guy, right? And, and it was so, and I, I don't, I just never have let myself believe that because someone may be effeminate, that that translates into any sexual preference thing. And um, so anyway, uh, this went on and uh, I was praying because what I thought, okay, I, said, I thought he was a preacher's kid and I thought Keith does not know how men, male friendships work, right? I mean, the way they work for me is if we're going to have coffee and you forget and don't show up, like to me, that, that's points. That's because sure enough, sooner or later, I'll forget. And that means, <laughs> that means we'll be okay, right? So I always feel like I'm, I gotta, I'm ahead of the game when that happens to me, but I never get upset, right? So I was with a group of seniors one Sunday morning in McAllister Place, and uh, and we took uh, we took a busload down, and I and and uh, you know they were shopping, and I sat down in the food court with an extra large Tim Hortons tea, <laughs> and and I, that was exactly where I wanted to be. I love watching people in in those kind of places. I sat there with my tea, and I was drinking my tea and praying and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and here's what I prayed. I said, Lord, um, would you teach me or help me to know how I can influence Keith so that he'll know how the guy friendship thing works? That's a good prayer, what, right? Yeah. I said, I just want to teach him, right? And um, so here, so I'm sitting there with my tea, and remember, this is coming from that place, this is what the Lord says. I've never had this happen, maybe, except one other time in my life, but, but I'm sitting there with my extra large tea, and, and, and I believe that God was saying this to me. Uh, Carl, I want you to ask Keith, have you ever been molested by or had a relationship with a homosexual? Now, you know, like, I, I, I almost literally gasped. Because I said, Lord, if he gets upset when I cancel a coffee appointment with him, and I ask him that question, and I'm wrong, how in the world am I going to recover from that? Right. But that was it. I was what I knew I was supposed to do verbatim. Okay, verbatim. So 
you know, we finished our day with the seniors, went back to Moncton. The next morning, I was going to Champlain Place on Wheeler Boulevard, and I had a 92 Golf hatchback. You know how small those are, right? And so I'm headed out of the office, and Keith says, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Champlain Mall. Keith says, can I go with you? And, and right away, my heart starts going like this, right? And so here we are in this golf, and my 250-pound friend is in the other three quarters of it, right? <laughs> and I'm headed to Champlain Mall, right? And, and I'm thinking, okay, God, I understand what you want me to say, but how do you romance that? How do you lead into that? I wasn't getting any direction, so I just said, Keith, have you ever had a relationship with or been molested by a homosexual? And, and, and just like that, he, he folded over and put his hand, or his, his head in his hands and, and, and on his knees, and he, he sobbed. He just convulsed. And... Uh, And I got to Champlain Place, and he was still doing that. I went in the store, did my business, come out. He was still doing that. I drove back to the church. He was still doing that. I hadn't said a word. He was just convulsing. And I thought, Lord, what have I done? Right? What in the world have I done? Was that really you speaking, or was that just me? If it's you, it's okay. If it's me... I don't want to ever do that again in my life, right? So he said, we got to be see. He couldn't talk. He said, he said, I'll get together with you next week. And we'll talk. And that was like a Friday. So he avoided me all weekend and Sunday services, played piano, and then we met the following Tuesday in Champlain or in the, in the park, Centennial Park. And he told me about how in, in as a young child in a Wesleyan uh, youth camp he had he had had experimented sexually or or been abused or whatever i'm not sure i don't remember the details now except that's where it began it continued through his teen years into his college years he was married had two kids and uh and uh <clears throat> anyway so i said keith i said i can't i can't hang on to this knowledge i have to share this so i did with the pastor. He lost his job, and they. Uh, and I had to go with him, as he told his wife what was going on. She was a wonderful, wonderful lady, and decided she was going to love her husband and stay with him. They stayed together, and uh, Keith passed away a few years ago now. I don't remember how many years? Uh, but uh, it was surgical complications. But there was a hurting, hurting man there, and. Uh, The fact that his wife stayed with him, he, and they held their marriage together as long as he lived, was amazing to me. It was amazing just the way his wife responded to that. His kids, wonderful kids. Um, that's happened to me similarly, not with that, a word like that, but two other times in the ministry that I've been working with people who have married homosexual people and their, their marriage has come apart. And part of the problem that we've had that I don't think, I hope we, don't, we would never have here, because I think we're working so that we don't have those kind of problems, is there has to be some place where people can talk about the things in their lives that they're struggling with, doesn't there? And yeah, a safe place. And there has to be some place where they can talk, where they know that if they're honest, they're not going to lose anybody. No matter what the struggle is, right? Now you know that it's harder to be church if people decide to create that kind of environment. We won't rate as high on the holy scale 
you know that, right? You know that if, if a church actually decided to be that way, and, and you know, they're grading us on that kind of a scale around here, people go, well, I want to go at least to an eight. You know we might not make that, right? You know, the thing that keeps people from God so often is we, we um, give people the impression that God is not, a, he's as unapproachable as we can be. Um, and, you know, my heart is that, like, I really would want people to believe that God is, is this way, right? God has his arms open wide, and the things that we think separate us from God, you know, God's, God's arms aren't shortened by, by, the, by the big mess that you think your life is in sometimes, right? <laughs> and it takes a lifetime for him to do his work in every one of our lives. And he works in different ways at different times in different people so that what God may be working on in my life could represent something that you figured out years and years ago and it's so elementary to you. But to me, it's a struggle. And if a group of people decide we're going to be a well church, you know, we have to allow God to work in his time, in his way, in his people. Whether or not what somebody else is struggling with represents something you've overcome or, or not, right? Ever hear, you know, I know of people, and, and God bless them, who struggle with things like, say, for instance, smoking, and some people can stop just like that, and, 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 but other people struggle with it for a lifetime. But they, you know, they say there's nothing worse than a reformed alcoholic or smoker, right? Because especially somebody who has an easy time with it, because they just think, well, I did it. You just make a decision and do it, but it doesn't work that way, right? It doesn't work that way. So anyway, I want to know who's talking to me in 2016. I want to hear God's voice. I want to know who's talking to me. Uh, Isaiah establishes that pretty clearly. I am, I am the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Just exactly who's speaking. And he says then, verse 18, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. One of the things that I want in 2016 is I want to speak of my experience with God in the present tense. Um, mindfulness. How many of you are familiar with that term? We don't own that term as well as some other religions do. Did you know that? What do you, th do, you do you know what religions, what religion I, I, I think primarily when I think of mindfulness, I think of Buddhism, right? But you know what mindfulness means, right? Mind what does mindfulness need, mean? It Put it in another, um, just rephrase it. What, what, what would mindfulness mean in our context? Being what? Purposeful. Purposeful, yeah. Yeah. I think I like that. that. And that's a great, that's a great reference to the scripture too. Yeah. Um, I like words like intentionality, to be intentional. And I like words like paying attention, right? Because sometimes I don't pay attention real well. That's, we, we were talking in Sunday school uh, class, there have been times in my life when I've found myself in the middle of something God is doing, and, and it's already been going on before I, I notice it. Well, 
I believe that God is already doing stuff and and sometimes it's just a matter of paying attention to what God is doing. But when I think of mindfulness, what that means to me is living in the moment. It means living right in the now. Because I can't change the past and I can't control the future. And if I, the problem is if I live too much in the past, I, ca I can't live in both places, right? Now, now think about this. This is what Isaiah was saying. This is what the Lord says. And if you read those next few verses, he, he talks about what he's going to do. For your sake, I will send to Babylon, bring down his fugitives, and so on and so forth. And then he goes, I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's creator, your king. Then he goes back to the past. This is what I've done. I'm the one who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew up the chariots and horses and the army and reinforcements, Together they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. What's he talking about there? What, what's that? The yeah, the Egyptian armies and the, you know, the deliverance of, of uh, the nation of Israel out of Egypt, but specifically the Red Sea miracle, right? So here's what God is saying. Now think about this. this is what, I am the Lord. This is the person who's talking. This is the kind of stuff I've done. This great, great, great kind of stuff, right, that would be great if you were, wouldn't be so great if you were on Pharaoh's side, but it was great, you know, on the other side of the thing. This is who I'm speaking. This is what I've done. And then this, this God who's done all this marvelous stuff in the past is saying what? Then? What's he saying? Forget it. <laughs> right? What he's saying is really... He's saying, I think, number one, live in the now, because that's where I am. Right now, that's the only time you can meet God. You can't meet God yesterday, and you can't meet him tomorrow. You can only meet him now. And this is where God works now, not then or then. But he's saying, you haven't seen anything yet. Think about all those miracles and stories in the Bible. Think about those. Things that, if that's true, then what God is saying is, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> yeah, hallelujah, right? Yeah, yeah. What, what I think is so tragic is, you know, if, if the only thing that we can point to in our lives is what God has done, I think that's sad. And if the only thing we have is stuff that we hope God can do or will do, that's sad too. But what is, what is really critical is, what about God right now? What about mindfulness? Whether you say, no, leave that term to the Buddhists or whatever. I don't care what the term is. I don't care what you, what you call it. Right? But what about the God of now? What about living in the present tense? I and mean, yeah, we've got a 365-degree circle that, that is ahead of us, right? And we have plans and hopes and dreams and all those are good. But, you know, what happens then really depends on what happens now, right now. Carol. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's, I mean, that is so simple. Carol, that is so simple, but so true, right? You can't be th thinking and be, you know, uh, focused on what's going to happen tomorrow and experience God today or, you know, regrets of the past. Don't we all have things we wish we'd done differently in the past? This is, of all places, comes out of the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, right? Chapter 3, and isn't it just like God to put the most beautiful things where you least expect to find them? Lamentations 3, 20 says, or maybe it starts at 19, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them and my soul is downcast with them. That's living in the past, right? Yet this I call to mind. What's that? 
it's mindfulness is now, right? Yeah. And therefore, what? It says, I have hope. Because of the great, the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. We sing this hymn for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Um, I'm, when I think about the faithfulness of God, that, that means every morning, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, you play that? In the morning when I rise, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus. I didn't mean to get that high. You can have all this world, give me Jesus. Jesus, right? Yeah. But they're new every morning. Every morning. You have, we have, we know a God who is faithful to, to now and to new. To now and to new. That's where I want to live. I want to live now and I want to live new. If any man be in Christ, he is a recycled creature, a, a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things right, are made new. Right? It would be great this year if God helps some of, some of us to maybe bust through some obstacles that we've been facing in our lives. Sure, you know, maybe it's an obstacle of fear. Do you, you realize how f much fear keeps us from in life? Times I'm afraid, right? Maybe 2016, God is going to ask you to, some of you to just trust Him and, and take a risk instead of playing it safe. What if 2016 for you is not the year when God wants you to play it safe? And with risk, there's always, you know, the potential of loss. But and, and anyway, but there may be some of those obstacles that God. There may be things in some of your lives that God wants to bring to resolution. Some of those dangling participles, you know, that you've been wanting to figure out, or you know, I believe that. Yeah, and I believe that it'll be great, whether it's big or not, right? Whether it's big or not. There are a lot of great things that aren't necessarily big. And I know I celebrate, like, uh, the, that verse, God restore to you the years the locusts have eaten. That is so relevant in my life right now. This is because I think this is speaking from a personal level, a miraculous answer to prayer in my own life. I believe that with all my heart. And this, this is great. This is great. Can't you see it? <laughs> Come on. You know, that's the kind of thing I mean, where you find yourself right in the middle of this, and all of a sudden you go, ah, God, God is at work here. Right? Well, I think it would be great. No, I think it'd be great in 2016 if, if a bunch of us could just realize that God is committed to love you. He's, he's made his intentions known, his declaration of love. And the only thing that you have to do is receive that. You don't have to pay it back. You don't have to earn it. You just have to receive it. I don't know of a prayer in my life that I would ever say God has answered the same way two times. 
is he's not in the encore performances, which means he's into new, whatever that is, great, small, whatever, you know. But there's that paradox, right? Whatever God involves himself in in our lives is great. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Whatever God chooses to involve himself in, in your life or mine, is not meaningless. It's not mediocre. It's what? It's great. When God works in the lives of his people, it is what? Great. Great. It's great. It is. It's great. That's a fair statement, right? Whatever that looks like. Not because of what happens, but because of who's at work. How's that? that? That's better. See, that's why we do this. We come up with better sermons. We talk this through. And this is ours. Think about that. It's ours. All right, we're going to pray. Elaine, I'm sorry. We're 10 minutes late and you've got to go. This would be a good time for you to sleep, to slip out while I'm praying. People wouldn't notice you're going. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, oh yeah, well we can't do that yet. Let's just pray. We can't let Gail go. We let, all right. Lord, thank you for your presence with your people this morning. That's when church happens. And I thank you for everyone's input and comments and their thoughts, Lord. Or, um, but whatever, whatever it's all about in the end, we, w- we want to march into a new experience of you. We want to march into days in which you show yourself to us in ways that we have not experienced before. You know, teach us new lessons, or we don't want to have to relearn the same old ones over and over again. But we want you to take us to places we've never been before in our spiritual journey. And reveal yourself to us in ways that you've never revealed yourself to us before. Usher us into an understanding of what it means to live by faith that is greater than any understanding we've had of that in the past. And Lord, we welcome the great working of a great God in our midst. And we praise you in advance for what we know you're doing even now. Open our eyes. Help us to see it to perceive it, this new thing. We pray it in Jesus' precious name. And three or four of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Great, we're done.